So we're here in Thessaloniki at the Nanotechnology Conference, and who are you? I am Nicholas Peppers. I am a professor of chemical and biomedical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, and I have also appointments in the medical school and in the pharmacy school. And uh, just a couple days ago, you, had the, you were speaking here at the plenary. Uh, what were you talking about? Basically, I was talking about uh, new applications of nanotechnology in the field of medical sciences and pharmaceutical sciences, and specifically how we can use new polymeric, biopolymeric systems in order to treat patients from debilitating diseases or from diseases that they have every day and where the present formulations, the present systems do not provide really the best solution. So I spoke specifically about, for example, applications in the field of uh, treatment of type 1 diabetes. As you know, diabetes is a debilitating disease. It affects many people. It is exhibited in the form of an inability to, uh, to lower the concentration of glucose, the result being, therefore, that because simply we cannot the patient cannot produce uh, the required insulin that is produced by the pancreas. So probably you're familiar with the present techniques, which are injections, or the use of a pump that the patient has to treat, to, to, to use externally. And, and my question to you is, will we be able to come to a system where the patient will be freer? And of course, immediately your mind goes to something like a capsule. A system uh, is a small capsule, it has nanoparticles in it, and it's able to be ingested and be delivered in the stomach or the intestine, wherever it's necessary. The problem is, with present technology, we cannot do that. Because insulin is an extremely sensitive molecule. If I take insulin and I put it in my mouth, in my saliva, it's destroyed biologically destroyed, which means it may still be the chemical structure of insulin, but it doesn't have the pharmacological ability. So how can we create systems that can be taken, say, orally, and be delivered in the upper small intestine, pass the stomach wall, we call that the intestinal wall, get into the blood, and the most important thing is act in the blood. And that is one of the many applications we have been working for years, coming up with new types of nanomaterials, nanobiomaterials, that can deliver drugs to specific parts of the body. So have you found some of those materials? Uh, or how do you find them? And uh, is like a, a, a organized way to try to find these materials? That's a very, very good question. Yes, there is an organized way. In the past, people have been trying heuristically, that is simply by saying, oh, this material will do well to use a particular material. Now we have computer models and new systems with which we can recreate or design a molecular structure that you think we, th we think is better for the patient. Uh, a structure, for example, that can go and stick in the upper small intestine. We call that a mucoadhesive system. And that will be able to deliver to the specific site. So there's a lot of work. There are in my laboratory chemists, biologists, biochemists, medical doctors. We work all together. We do chemistry, the biology. We do the delivery of the drug outside of the body to see how it delivers. And then we do the delivery in cells and effectively in animals, selected animals, very carefully, in order to be able to reproduce what would happen in a human. And the work is supported by major uh, American organizations like the National Institutes of Health. And eventually, of course, there are agreements with a number of companies for possible commercialization. So the, when, you, when you get the insulin uh, shot and when you want to get through the intestine, is it the same kind of uh, destination it can go, both of them? Where does we, it need to go? No. If I really, uh, that's a, a really a, an exceptional uh, question because with an injection, you have a, something that goes directly in the tissue 
and from the tissue goes into the blood. With the systems that I'm talking about, we have particles that arrive on top of the intestinal wall, allow the insulin to pass through the wall, and then where is the insulin? Directly in the blood. So some people say that maybe our technology is a little bit more desirable because we are able to go directly in the blood. The problem is some of the insulin is always consumed, destroyed, metabolized as it passes through the intestinal wall. Uh, so I believe, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure, that not 100% of the insulin will be able to get into the blood, okay? Is there any way to use nanotechnology or something else to teach the pancreas to create more insulin by itself? Absolutely, and there are other colleagues who develop nanotechnology to develop new types of artificial pancreas systems. Very important area. Significant work being done, and other companies support that work. I don't know which one will be successful, but the important thing is that our patients should be sure that in the next few years there will be alternatives to just simply having an injection. Now, let me tell you, we talked about diabetes. There are other diseases where this oral delivery, or as we call it, transmucosal delivery, has a huge impact. And one of them is the area of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. And if you have a minute, I will tell you a little story, which I did not mention, I think, two days ago. Uh, in 1992, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I was immediately prescribed what was available at that time, a, a, a medicine, a therapeutic agent called interferon beta. Interferon beta is a wonderful molecule. It slows down the arrival of disability in multiple sclerosis. It does not return you back to the original condition. It slows down. But it has to be given intramuscularly. Now, I don't know if you've had intramuscular injections. They can hurt because you have a needle of a certain length which penetrates straight down into the muscle. It's done only once a week. But the reality is that you have to do it several, uh, one, once a week for, for the rest of your life. And of course, every time you penetrate the tissue, there is some scar tissue developing, which means the next time it's more difficult or more painful to have that process. So at that time I started thinking, is there any way to do an oral delivery of interferon beta? The problem is oral delivery of interferon beta is difficult because Interferon beta is a very sensitive molecule. It has a very small window of pHs where it works. So we started working, several of us, designing systems and so on. Big support from a Japanese company. Uh, early data with uh, cells and then with small animals. Absolutely wonderful. Indicating that indeed we can deliver interferon beta orally, bypassing this terrible you know, uh, injections orally into the patient. No product has come out in the market yet, and there are reasons why it hasn't, but, uh, but it is really very promising. Why not in the market yet? Because not all 100% of the, of the drug, of the therapeutic agent, gets into the blood. Some of it is lost. Because, as I said before, you ingest it. It goes in the stomach. It mixes with the food. You cannot tell the patient, don't eat for 12 hours. That's not a possibility. And, and so what happens? If you have an expensive therapeutic agent, such as interferon beta is, and you see only 50% of that delivered in the blood, there is a financial question that has to be answered. It's not the a, chief not financial officer of the company has to decide, am I willing to accept this product? Because the patients will be, feel better, they will not have as much pain. There's no other way to deliver it to the blood? Uh, you could say that there would be the transdermal way, passing through the skin. It's not possible, it's a very large molecule, okay? Different investigators look at different possibilities. What about nasal? How about uh, sublingual way? they haven't worked, okay? I still believe the oral way, for me, is the best. So, How about 
uh, sorry. How about uh, arthritis and cancer? Do you yeah, have any, that's, any solutions that's, that's on that? That's very interesting. Let's let's take them one by one. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very debilitating disease, and it is an autoimmune disease as well, is a disease that is presently treated by an antibody that is given to the patient uh, by injection, by injection. And it is one situation that I believe there can be a better treatment again, oral delivery, and we are developing such a system for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Another area, uh, osteoporosis. There are several ways to treat osteoporosis. One of them is with a particular drug called calcitonin, which again, instead of doing it by injection, we could do it in an oral form and so on. Let's talk briefly about cancer. We are working moderately. Other groups spend all their time on cancer. It's a difficult project because cancer treatment drugs are, as we call them, hydrophobic. They don't like water. And so what do they have? They have a tendency uh, to be difficult to deliver into the body. So you have to come up with a totally new de design. So what I'm saying right now, I'm not willing to talk yet about our studies. There is a possibility. Some companies have done some very good work, nanotechnology. But of course, you can always see the naysayers who will say that nanotechnology for cancer has not helped us. Why is it hydrophobic? It's hydrophobic because those drugs, such as a drug called doxorubicin, uh, cisplatin, drugs like this, uh, they simply don't have many functional groups that like water. Okay, they have a low solubility in water, uh, they have to be bound with something else, maybe with a surfactant. It gets into too much of a chemical project. But the important thing is it's a little bit more difficult to do. Also, don't forget something else. We are talking here about the situation of oral delivery, but sometimes we would like to have oral delivery to go to only specific cells. In this particular case, you don't want to treat the whole patient. You would prefer to treat only the cancerous cells. So we're talking about situation of targeting. So the question is, can we do nanotechnology and targeting at the same time? That's the difficult part. When you talk about delivery, it's just basically uh, nanotechnology and pills, right? So is it possible that there might be one solution that works for all these different diseases, that kind of uh, compatible with well, everything, uh, or each me, one is different? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, let me correct one little thing. I don't like to use the word pills. Uh, yeah, deliberately, I use the word systems. It can be particles, it can be compressed particles, it can be films, and so on. So that's the one thing. Now, is it one technology? That's an interesting question. There are platforms, that is, general technologies, that people try to adjust so that they can deliver different drugs, but they cannot deliver every drug. So you're always talking about modifying, creating new molecular design, new molecular entities, so that you can deliver uh, the drug. So we have a number of platforms, here, if you wish. And at the intestine level, the place where there's a door to the blood, there's always some kind of chemical reaction that you can work uh, with. Chemical reaction, yes, there is, and you could take it to your advantage. Thank you for saying that. And that's why there are certain molecules called that create conjugates, a molecule that is waiting there. Oh, insulin is coming. Let me capture it and transfer it to another side, like an elevator, pretty much. You are absolutely right. And this can be an endocytotic mechanism and so on. Uh, but again, it's not a technology that will be applied to everything. And how far are we from all this? Uh, For lots of users. work, lots of work, lots of exciting results. And of course, cellular studies and animal studies and clinical studies. But we have, when we arrive at the clinical studies, we have to prove that our new system will never give us a false positive means it will never tell a patient to take the particular compound when he or she does not need it. So, you know, there is a lot of work to be done still, but I am not very negative. I think within two to four years, we will have several of these therapeutic agents in the market already. Okay. And things can accelerate with bigger funding or how? 
Uh, funding is always helpful. I think they can be accelerated with having new ideas, new original ideas. And that's why I believe in something that in the United States and in Europe now we call it convergence. The ability to bring people from different dissimilar areas who work on the same problem. Uh, as I close, there is something I want to say. Scientists are always excited to come up with a new development, a new system, a new treatment. But scientists in the medical field have a special calling. We meet the patients, we see the patients, we are next to the patients. They affect us, they become part of our lives, they become part of our families. When I see a patient that suddenly sees better because I developed a new ocular, means for the eyes, delivery system that really will allow her to see better and the medicine to be delivered over a long period of time. And she says, thank you for doing this. That's my biggest satisfaction. Same thing with the multiple sclerosis. If I see that a patient says, I don't have to take an injection once a week, or maybe I take an injection now once a year, because I hate shots. And the rest of the time I will take your little pills, as you said them, or capsules and so on. I'm the happiest person in the world, okay? So, and I think when you talk to people in this conference and anywhere else, you will see that those of us in the medical field, eh, we are a little bit mavericks in the sense that we are excited to help people, you know? There's a big hope out there. Yeah, there is.